Hey everybody, this is the pre-lab piece for your ballistic pendulum. Uh, in case you're not here or you need to see the practice questions again, the group practice together again, then you can watch this video. Uh, ballistic pendulum, this is what it looks like. It is a device designed specifically to measure the speed of a projectile. It was actually the first machine capable of doing this. It was invented in uh, 1742 by an English scientist named Robin or Robbins, and uh, it operates off the principle of conservation of momentum. So um, that's the objective for this lab, is to determine the initial velocity of a projectile by analyzing the conserved momentum. Uh, our procedure is basically going to be to fire the pendulum, collect an angle of measure that it creates five times, that way you have a nice average, and then that angle represents a height reached by the projectile and the catcher. And the catcher bob uh, has a mass, and so does the marble. So since these guys stick together, uh, this is generally considered to be an inelastic collision. Um, there is a small amount of energy loss, but momentum is still conserved. So based off of the height that the pendulum actually reaches you'll be able to calculate the gravitational potential energy that it would have. Uh, that gravitational potential energy is the same as the kinetic energy that it had before it started rising, which means that you can find speed. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, here's an example problem. It says that you've got a steel marble of mass 7 grams, and you fire it from a spring-powered launcher into the catcher of a ballistic pendulum. Uh, the arm length of the pendulum, that's from the axis of the rotation down to the hammer. In other words, how long it is uh, from the, the rotating part to the center of the catcher. 12 centimeters, and it has a mass of 60 grams. And that pendulum uh, swings upward, and I'm guessing they did this several times, and on average that comes out to 25 degrees. So the very first thing you want to do is take the information that we do know out of the question, and uh, let's just kind of diagram this here. So the ball, the marble, is 7 grams. That's 7 thousandths of a kilogram, right? Because there's 1,000 grams in a kilogram. So I'm going to write the number 7 thousandths. That's 0 .007. That's the mass of the bullet you're shooting. And it hits a catcher, and the mass of the catcher is 60. So that's 0 .060 kilograms. And then the arm is 12 centimeters long. Um, in meters, that would be 12 hundredths of a meter, 0.12. Okay? Now, the other thing is, the thing that rises, and this is what a lot of people struggle with, the thing that rises is not just the pendulum or the projectile. The thing that rises is a projectile stuck in a pendulum. So you actually have to add them together for a lot of this step. So, uh, 60 grams plus 7 grams is 67 grams. 0 0.067 is our combined mass. Okay? So, for step A, what you're going to want to do is create a diagram of what's going on here. And when you fire the ballistic pendulum, it's going to start out... Let me see if I can get a drawing going on here. So let's at the end of the game, uh, the pendulum is downward, right? The pen turned off on me. The pendulum starts out vertical, right? And it's uh, 0.12 meters long. Right? And that's all. And then you shoot it. And after you shoot it, it becomes uh, kicked out, right? So when you kick it out, now the pendulum is here. And it's still the same pendulum. So it's still 0.12 meters long. And... There's a displacement because of that. So here's the displacement, and we'll call it R. Right? Now, that angle is the top angle. So the angle kicked out by the pendulum, what the protractor on the side reads, is this one at the top. Where is that pendulum now? Well, it's 25 degrees off the vertical. So to that, let me add... Twenty-five degrees. So you got this little twenty-five degree angle at the top, right? And that's all you have to do for A is just diagram the problem. Now, 
for B, we have to solve this first triangle. So we have this triangle, and it's a triangle, so it has a total angle measure of 180 degrees. It's an isosceles triangle, which means that the two sides that are 0.12 meters, these two equivalent guys here, are each the same. Sorry, I'm trying to see if I can make that smaller, a little bit, a little bit less huge. I've got it on the biggest. There we go. Much better. Uh, these guys are isosceles, so that means that these two angles at the top are the same. That's 25 degrees, and what that means is that these two little guys at the bottom have to be the same, right? Two sides that are same, two angles that are same, isosceles triangle. So to find the remaining angles of this first triangle, if the triangle equals 180 degrees... Then here's the expression that shows this. We've got a 25 plus 2 of something. So the question is, what would that something be? Well, if that, uh, let's go ahead and set that equal to 180. So we can do our algebra here. Pardon my poor handwriting. 180 equals 25 plus 2 of something. Well, we're doing algebra, so let's get rid of that 25 and we'll subtract it and put it on the other side. That leaves me with uh, 160, uh, 155, right? So 155 equals 2 of something. And if we divide by 2, we're going to get the uh, measure of both of those remaining angles. And that's important because that's information that we need. So I'm going to go to my calculator here. I'm going to do 155 divided by 2. And I'm going to hit her. 77.5 is that angle. Okay? So the remaining angle here is 77.5 each. All right? Now to find side R, which is the missing side, it's the displacement of the bob. How far did the bob go? Uh, here's what you're going to want to do. There's several ways that you can do this. Um, one method that I've used in the past is to, past is to use a trigonometric ratio. For example, um, you couldn't use sine or cosine because there's not a hypotenuse here. If you look at this triangle, it's got two sides that are the same and one that's not. But none of those is definitely the third longest side. So we can't use sine or cosine. And um, you could use tangent but it's not the best, most accurate way. You're going to be off by just a little bit if you do that. So the very, very, very best way uh, I'm going to show you now. Basically, what you want to do is take this triangle, and it's got an angle at the top of 25, right? What you want to do is bisect this triangle in half, and we'll turn it into a triangle that does have a right angle, and it does have uh, a longest side. So now the longest side is that 0 0.12, right? And we want to find this. This is actually like half of R. And now this over here is the other half of R. So basically, if we can solve for this side of this triangle and then multiply it by 2, we'll have a very, very, very accurate number. Uh, to do that, let's see, we got the opposite of this 25 degree angle, which is now also chopped in half. So I'm going to turn it into 12.5. And we have a hypotenuse of 12. So I might write this as the sine of 12.5 equals our unknown this is actually, remember, it's half. It's kind of funky. Half of that, uh, and then the hypotenuse is 0 0.12, right? So let me solve real quick. The sine of 12.5 times 0 0.12. And that's going to give us um, half of what R is. Do you want to make sure uh, these these sometimes default to radians, so we're going to pick degrees to make sure that we are not going to make a mistake there. All right, so um, sine 
12.5, enter, and then that times 0.12, enter. All right, 0.0259. Um, remember, that's half because we chopped this triangle in half. That's half of what R is. So 0 0.02597. We probably don't need that many digits, but 0 0.0259. Okay. Um, that times 2 is going to be R. And again, in the past, we've done this with tangent. If um, this seems kind of funky, you can get close using tangent, but it won't be perfect. This is the way to be perfect. 0 0.0259 times 2. All right, times 2. So it looks like the displacement is 0 0.0519. We want three digits, so let's say 519. 0 0.0519. I promise that is the hardest step in this whole thing. It's a displacement in meters. Okay. Ooh, a little tilty there. There we go. He's trying to get it go down. All right. So basically, the triangle moves 0 0.0519 meters at some angle. The other thing we need to know is the rise angle. So basically, here's what you do you take that R that we just found out. That is a displacement. And gravity is up and down, right? Vertical. Gravity's acceleration is only vertical as well. So what you want to do is find the vertical component of that displacement because the vertical component is the only one that represents work upward. So we have to find the new triangle. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a new triangle where I've got the R that we just found as the resultant, which, what did we say that number was? 0 0.0519. This is R, 0 0.0519. Um, low key, here's the other triangle. Right? Okay. This is the vertical H that we're looking for. And then we have a right angle. And then we have this uh, unknown angle here and this unknown angle here. So we have to use a trig ratio to find this uh, missing side H. And the problem is we only have a right angle and one side. We need another angle. Uh, we need to be able to find another angle, right? So the problem here is that I don't know which angle to choose. Um, I could choose this one down here or I could choose this one up here. There's not very much information about this upward angle, and in fact, it's not really possible to use this angle uh, to find... Well, I can't find this angle, basically. I can't. Uh, this down here is a much more doable thing, okay? So remember, in a previous step, um, we had this other first triangle, and the top of the triangle was 25 degrees, right? And that made the bottom two angles of that triangle each... 77.5, right? If that angle right there is 77.5, and this is the horizontal axis, and this is the vertical axis, that whole thing is a 90-degree angle. Agreed? So we can find this rise angle, and we're going to call it theta for angle, theta prime. That's our rise. Now the fun thing is, all you have to do is find out what number makes that theta prime plus 77.5 equal 100, or not 180, 90. It's a right angle. So 90 minus 77.5 is going to give us our answer. Um, it looks like that rise angle is going to be 12.5. Well, let's see. 77.5. I've slept since we've done this. 77.5. Yeah, 12.5. Okay. So theta, theta prime is 12.5 degrees. And that goes here. Okay. We need to find H. H is the height that the energy is dependent on. 
So now we have this triangle where there is a 12.5 degree angle. And we want to know this is 12.5. We have an opposite unknown and we have the hypotenuse of this triangle. So in this case, if we look at our trig ratios, the one that has opposite hypotenuse and an angle is sine. So we're going to use sine to find h. And it goes like this. The sine of 12.5 is going to be equal to our unknown h over the hypotenuse of the triangle, which was 0 0.0159. 0 0.05, sorry, 519, right? 519. Okay. Uh, we'll simplify that. The sine of 12.5 times 0 0.0519 is going to equal h. So we're going to type that in. Again, uh, be sure that you're in degrees mode, not radians mode. Sine 12.5, enter, then times 0 0.0519, enter. You can also do it in one straight shot. Um, you just have to be careful. A lot of people would do this, sine 12.5 times 519. You see how that puts them in the same group there together? That's going to give you a different answer. See, it's off by quite a bit. So if you wanted to do it in one straight shot, you would have to go sine 12.5 and then leave those grouping symbols and then type the 0.0519 outside. Make sure that they're separate and uh, separated by grouping symbols. 0.0112, okay? That means that H .0112 meters. In other words, um, it goes about five centimeters outward and at an angle. And the vertical component of that is about 1.1 centimeters up. So it doesn't rise by very much. Okay? Those are the hard parts done. After that, it's just crunching the numbers. So uh, the gravitational potential energy for step D. Now that we know a height, what you want to do is use the gravitational energy equation, which, if you remember, is mass times gravity times height. And the mass of this object, what actually rises? Not just a ball, not just a pendulum, it's a ball stuck in a pendulum, right? So that means that we're going to use the combined mass of a ball in a pendulum of 0 0.067 kilograms. So we got 0 0.067. On Earth, where gravity is 9.81, and it rises 1.1 centimeters in the air, so 0 0.0112, just like that. And that answer will be, uh, let me just pull, multiply 0 0.0112 times 9.81 times 0 0.067. 0 0.00769. Okay, that's energy. So we're going to write 0 0.00769, right? Yeah, and we're going to write, since it's energy, J for joules. Now, that's the energy that was in the object at the maximum height. That's when all the energy has been converted to gravitational. Before that, all of the energy was kinetic, right? And then before that, it was, you know, kinetic energy of the uh, moving marble inside the moving pendulum. Then it was the kinetic energy of just the marble. And hopefully most of that energy was conserved. And then it was the elastic potential energy of the spring gun. So you actually know the energy at all times. All the energy must total out to this number, right? In a perfect world. Now, this isn't perfect, but we're going to be close. The kinetic energy of the combined mass before it started rising and converting that energy to gravitational should be the same number. You do not have to calculate anything for step E. Because of the law of conservation of energy... These two guys get to be the same. And this right here is the step that lets us do the work. Because that energy represents a mass moving at a speed. We have to find the speed of the thing before we can find its momentum. Okay? So for that kinetic energy 
on step F is actually where you're going to use the kinetic energy equation. Uh, and if you remember, the kinetic energy equation is Ke equals half. It's not what I wanted. Half times mass times velocity squared. Okay? So if I plug in for that, we know the energy, we know the mass, but we do not know the velocity, and that's what we're trying to find. So if the energy is 0 0.00769, the mass is the combined mass. Right after they hit, they're combined in one mass. That's why we call this as an inelastic collision. And that combined mass is what's going to rise. So 0.5 times the 0.067 for the combined mass times velocity squared. And you see how velocity is our one unknown. So that's the thing that we're actually trying to find out here. Um, to solve for V, we've got to do a square root to get rid of a square. And we've also got to uh, get rid of these terms that are known. So 0.5 and 0.067. So I might do it like this, 0 .0 0 .0 0 0.00769, and I'm going to divide by the 0 0.5 times the 0 0.067. This is half times mass right there. So if I do that, I'm going to end up with 0 0.2295 equals V squared. Okay, and then to solve for a square, you've got to do a square root. So we're looking for the square root of 0.2295. Second, square root button is right here. 0.2295, enter. 0.4791. Okay, so 0.479 meters per second. Okay, that's how fast. I don't like that it, it capitalized that. I told it to stop, but it still capitalizes things for me. 0.479 meters per second is how fast the combined mass is moving after the impact. All right, for step G, the momentum of that combined mass. So we know the mass of the object. It's the 0.067, right? And we know how fast it's going now because we solve for the energy. So the momentum of the system is P equals mv, correct? So if we know that P is our unknown, we know that the mass is 0 0.067 kilograms moving at 0.479 meters per second. We just have to multiply those two numbers together. So 0 0.067 times... 0.479. And you get a momentum. The number is 0.032. I'm going to round that to a 1. 0.0321. I'm trying to keep three digits at all times here. 0 0.0321. Was that the number? Yeah. Okay. And the unit for this momentum is the kilogram meter per second because we multiplied some kilograms by some meters per second. Okay, and then now we are on the very last step. If momentum is mass times velocity, and momentum is supposed to be conserved because of the law of conservation of momentum, then what that means is that the momentum has to be the same at all times. If the momentum of the moving mass was 0.0321 because of the speed that it had and the mass that it had, if we apply that momentum to the smaller mass of the marble, you will then find the velocity of the marble before it hit. Okay, it would be something like this. So let's say you got, this is your before, right? You got your spring loader, you got a marble traveling, and it's going to have P, right? And this is your after. You got the, the pendulum head, the hammer, with a ball in it. And then it's going to be moving 
much slower. I think we said 0.479, right? But it also still has P. So that's P2, and this is P1. The law of conservation of momentum says that P1 has to equal P2. So we know the momentum. We don't know the speed, and that's what we're looking for, but we can weigh the marble, right? So at the very beginning of this problem, long, long, long time ago, we had the mass of the marble, and the mass of the marble was 7 grams, right? 0 0.007 kilograms. And we know that P equals 0 0.0321. It has to be the same from the last question because momentum is conserved. So what we're looking at is this. Uh, P equals mv. The P is the 0 0.0321. The mass is 0 0.007 times some velocity. And we're solving for velocity. So basically what I'm telling you is you take that momentum and you divide by the new mass, and you're going to find out the new speed. 0 0.0321 divided by 0 0.007. 0 0.0321 divided by 7 grams, 7 thousandths of a gram. That's too many. There we go. 4.5, I'm going to round that to 9. 4.59 meters per second. Four point five nine meters per second, and that's how you solve for the initial velocity of a projectile that hits a ballistic pendulum. Lots and lots of steps. This is a very long single problem, but it's not anything that you don't know how to do. Um, just for kicks, to verify that we got a correct answer, uh, I might just just as a bonus, let's find the ke of that marble and see if it was conserved. And uh, this is something that you will have to do in your analysis. So you will find the kinetic energy of the marble on question number seven here and compare it to the kinetic energy of the uh, marble with the hammer together uh, that we use to find the problem. And the idea here is that uh, in a perfect world, as in here on paper and group practice, if Ke is half times mass times velocity squared, uh, if I find that kinetic energy, it's going to match, hopefully. 0.5 times a mass of 0 0.007 times how fast it's going, 4.59 times 4.59 velocity squared. All right. What you'll find in the lab is that the number is going to be larger in your analysis than it will be here. Uh, the, the, the kinetic energy of the projectile after the hit is going to be less than the kinetic energy of the projectile before the hit, uh, mainly because of energy loss, because this is an inelastic collision. There's going to be energy loss. We try to make it as uh, low as possible. That's why we're using the fancy machine. But um, you can hear it. You know, there's vibrations in the hammer. It's still a nearly perfect collision but there's still going to be some energy loss. Let's see, 0 0.00737. If we go back to our original number for energy, 0 0.00737, we're pretty close, 0 0.00769. So we were off by a ten, three ten thousandths, which is pretty good, right? On paper, no energy loss. In the real world, uh, when you do this lab, there's going to be some energy loss. So accounting for that is going to be part of your analysis. Uh, if you have any questions, give me a shout, and um, hope to see you all on the web.